Okay. Shh. As we finish up, as we finish up chapter 40, chapter 40, chapter 40, we started chapter 40 last week, and uh, I don't remember exactly the title of chapter 40. Was basic principles of animal form and function. What? What a what a wonderful title. Basic. Yeah, basic. Okay. So, so long. We left off on Friday uh, talking about how animals basically fall into one of two categories. Oh, oh, oh. They are animals and endothermic. They are endothermic. Okay. Homeotherms like us. Or they are endothermic poikilotherms. Now, it is possible. It is possible for you to have an animal that is an ectothermic homeotherm, but it is extremely rare. An ectothermic homeotherm. And so we've got, I want to write these two terms endothermic. Homeotherm. Somebody tell me what this means based on the name or the I, I, the, the, the description. Rick. It, it regulates its internal uh, processes. Yeah, right, yeah, that is true. They do regulate their internal processes, right? Because we gave you we gave you that there are basically two options when temperature changes. Uh, you can take, you can, you can conform and be an ectothermic poikilotherm, or you can regulate and be an endothermic homeotherm. But based on these words, what does this mean, well, Carrie? Doesn't endo mean like inside out or something? Yes. Yes. Heat, heat is, is produced within organism. And, <laughs> shh, what does homeotherm mean? Same. Same. And temperature is kept the same. That's what this term literally means. That the bulk of the heat that an animal has is coming from internal processes. And that that temperature is kept the same. Yeah, Trinity. No, I just I don't know what happened. You were at, you were gonna ask, is there a big space for a reason? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, this is what we do. We will regulate internal processes to maintain our temperature. Your body temperature pretty much stays between 36 and 38 degrees Celsius at all times. Between 36 and 37 even. Between even really like 36 and a half and 37 and a half. Your body temperature really only varies about a degree Celsius unless you're sick and your immune system is raising your body temperature in an effort to fight infection. Mr. Hansen. Okay. So I, I, I'm assuming when it comes to these, like, the end of the, to these two terms here. Yes. Like, so. For these animals, these are these really include like mammals and birds. Yes, correct. And You're absolutely right. The and the ones would be like reptiles. Yes, fish, you are absolutely fish, right. Like other. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yep, you are absolutely right. Okay. Shh. So this tells us that the heat is produced within the organism. What processes are going to produce heat? Yes. Cellular respiration. So what this is telling us is that for an endothermic animal, the bulk of the heat that they deal with is coming from cellular respiration. So this is only going to work for animals with a very rapid metabolic rate. For animals that are oxygen that are consuming oxygen like crazy and producing enormous amounts of energy. 
So it's only going to work for really active animals, like Mr. Hansen pointed out, mammals and birds. Okay, primarily mammals and birds. Now, ectothermic poikilotherms. According to this term, what does this mean? Outside. Yep, that the bulk of the heat comes from outside. Heat comes from outside. And temperature varies. Okay? Almost. Almost every single animal falls into one of these two categories. And that's why, almost, that's why we call these conformers, their temperature varies a lot. It basically is equal to their environment. Oh, so that's like a reptile. Yes. Yep. It is like a reptile. And like fish, amphibians, insects. Because I gotta let, like, uh, lizard, gotta lay in the sun. You gotta lay in the sun. You gotta soak up that sun. Emma. Uh, okay, so then why is a heated tank necessary if you want fish, like for some fish, they can't conform to it? Oh, because, I mean, they're going to, they, they still have an optimal temperature, and most of the fish where you really need to control temperature are from tropical areas where temperature doesn't vary very much. Uh -huh. And so they, they will conform to their external environment, but they'll likely not thrive in that environment. Do that, do that. Uh, the top Correct. Yep, you're absolutely right. And it's the same thing that's true for like a reptile. If you've got a terrarium, you usually need to put a heat lamp in there and you need to make sure the temperature doesn't drop too low. I, 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 I used to have a beard dragon. Like, the guys had to have, had to have like the heat lamp on. Because you got to think about, so, so lizards that live in the desert here, at night the temperature might fall to 40 degrees, but where are they at night? They're underground, where the temperature is a lot more stable. It doesn't drop as much. It doesn't climb as much. Okay? All right. Endothermic homeotherm. So almost every animal falls into one of these two categories. It is technically possible to have an ectothermic homeotherm. But I don't know of a single example of an ectothermic homeotherm because that would mean you need to maintain a tight range of temperatures, but to rely primarily on external conditions. That's really, really tough to do. But there are many examples of endothermic poikilotherms, where the bulk of their heat comes from within, but that they allow for a wider range of temperatures. There are a lot of examples of these. The best examples come from really active predatory fish, okay? And because they're, bless you, because they're really active, their metabolic rate is high, so the bulk of their heat is coming from metabolic processes, Shh. but they still allow for a wider range of values. A great white shark, excellent example of an endothermic poikilotherm. The bulk of its heat is coming from its metabolic processes, but it allows for a wider range of temperatures. Shh. Another great example of an endothermic poikilotherm, honeybees. Yeah, I, oh, honeybees, they're so cute until you get stung by one. Okay, Emma said that. Who said honeybees? Emma said that. Who said that? Who said that? Who said that? I was like, oh, they're so cute. Yeah, see how cute it is. Do great white sharks give live birth? Or do they lay eggs? They give live birth. They give live birth. That's special. A lot of sharks give live birth. Are sharks like snakes? Not all sharks like snakes. He said, did you have a question? Oh, I don't know. 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 What's that, Isa? Oh, okay. Yeah. So endothermic homeotherms, basically every mammal and bird is, a, is an endothermic homeotherm. Now, when, animal, when mammals hibernate, their body temperature will drop. And so sometimes they'll abandon this homeothermy, but they're hibernating. So it's totally cool, right? Yeah, Mark. So you said there are like basically almost every single animal that's One of these two categories. Yes. So what are some that don't? A great white shark. It's an endothermic poikilotherm. Honeybees are also an endothermic poikilotherm. I don't know of any examples of an ectothermic 
homeotherm. Isa. How does hibernation work? It depends. In true hibernation, you basically go into a, uh, a period of what we call prolonged torpor, where you slow your metabolic rate down and you lose a lot of your internal controls, and you basically allow your body to conform to the environment. And that's what your true hibernators do. So ground squirrels, the ground squirrels we have around here, they're true hibernators. So they will they will conform when they go into that period of prolonged torpor or uh, rest, uh, if you will, that they'll allow their body temperature to cool, they'll really slow their metabolic rate down, and they'll conform to environmental conditions. But they're also underground, so temperature doesn't vary as much. And then you have things like bears. Bears are not true hibernators. Bears, they don't go fully dormant. They go to kind of a reduced activity level. So like uh, female bears give birth while, while they're hibernating. And that's not exactly restful, right? So they'll give birth and nurse their young while they're hibernating. They're not true hibernators. We say bears hibernate, they just basically disappear for the winter. They overwinter. I, I love how like when we think of hibernation, we, like, we almost all imagine think, think of bears, bears and they are not true hibernators. Yeah. 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 So now the key with hibernation, Isa and everyone, the key with hibernation is it's a prolonged period of turper, which is just a, a period of arrested activity that's over winter. That's the key with hibernation. So our true hibernators are small rodents that live underground, our true hibernators, and bats. Those are true hibernators. Then you have you have fake hibernators like bears and uh, tree squirrels. That's an animal. That's our mammals, yeah. And then uh, you have a prolonged period of turpor that will happen in the summer for many animals, like during the hard, hottest part of the summer, and that's called estivation. Okay. Like yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Shh. There's one more thing we need to talk about from chapter 40, and then we'll be done with chapter 40. Okay. 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 So the last concept is this. If you are an endothermic homeotherm, which you are, and the bulk of your heat is coming from within, and you have to maintain a very narrow range of temperatures, what happens when you move to a colder place? Or when you move to a warmer place? Your um, body works more. Yes. So here. Endothermic homeotherms must adjust their metabolic rate. I know we were putting I know, right? But I didn't. So just start a new line. Just go down and write this again. Just relax. Must adjust metabolic rate to maintain narrow temperature range. And so they've got to adjust their metabolic rate to maintain narrow temperature range. We call this process homeostasis, that is maintaining the narrow body, uh, the body temperature range. We call that homeostasis. And now this process of adjusting your metabolic rate to maintain this is called acclimation. And so some of you will experience this in a very, very real way in a little over a year from now. Because some of you are going to go to university in really cold places that are very different from where you've lived for at least the last few years. Some of you are going to have the great joy of going to school in the Chicago area, 
Or maybe going to some fancy Ivy League school in the Northeast. Yeah, Minnesota. chasing us hard. Minnesota? Not Apple. Or go to the University of North Dakota? Or the University of Wyoming? Go to the hot station. Where the average, the average high temperature in January is a blistering 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Ryan was out there with a negative 18. Who's Ryan? He was a senior. His last name is not with the I'm sorry. So this process of adjusting metabolic rate to maintain the narrow temperature range, acclimation. Okay? And so you've heard this, right? You've got to acclimate. You gotta acclimate. Okay, it's a it's an actual adjustment in your metabolic rate so that you can maintain that narrow range. Care. Um, is acclimation a specific type of adaptation? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Now, the mechanisms by which you acclimate are an adaptation. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, Emma. So if you live in a colder area and, um, like, I don't know, like, for example, say the population of a really cold place, they got their body has to work more, like, they can metabolize faster. Yes. Are they, like, like, tend to be skinnier? <laughs> um, probably so. I mean, all things being equal, they, they probably would be. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Because this is it for chapter 40. And we're done. And that's our first of three chapters today. we got 30 minutes. Oh, I know. I found one that works every single time. It's like it doesn't rip it. Did you buy it? No, I found one that works. Okay, you all ready for chapter 43? Chapter 43, immunology. Single word chapter title. Immunology. In, oh my goodness, what is happening? You know why that happened? Because y'all are whispering. You're not even bothering to whisper. Y'all are having full on, full on maximum volume conversations. Immunology. If you have any, if you have any space in your heart for concern for my emotional well-being, <laughs> immunology. I like how we just. Okay, <laughs> immunology. We have two branches of the immune system. Innate system adaptive this marker is not very it's not working for I'm not me with the marker okay yeah. wow <laughs> so there are two branches of our immune system there's the innate system and there's the adaptive system the innate system found in all animals, as far as we know, in some way, we've got an innate system present in all animals. This is primarily phagocytic cells. Phagocytic? Yeah. What is phagocytosis? Somebody remind me. We talked about this when we were talking about our ways of moving material into and out of cells. It's phagocytosis is a type of endocytosis. So primarily phagocytic cells, these eat foreign material. Foreign material. Foreign material. 
So these phagocytic cells, when they will break, they will eat anything that is not your own tissue, your own cells. Oh, yeah, I kind of that. Yeah, Emma. Is there a case where like, they go like crazy and start eating their? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yep. So the arthritis is uh, is primarily triggered by either an overexpression of. Um, What's the term I'm looking for? Inflammatory materials, or when these cells start to attack your own tissue. That's that's Why is, is that the only sign of that? Like, is, is arthritis one like the only sign of Oh, no. Like, so this, so MS is another autoimmune disease, and oftentimes the cause of it is are these innate immune cells that are consuming pieces of your neurons. They're basically consuming the, the, the sheath, the cells that surround so your axons. So what is, like, so when you get, because I know older people tend to have arthritis, but sometimes younger yes. people have it. So is it something that will just happen over time, or can you, like, avoid the meeting? It depends on the cause. If it's, if it's truly an autoimmune cause, it, you probably can't avoid it, other than avoiding, like, certain dietary triggers that increase your immune response. But sometimes it's just chronic damage. You know, it's like... So like when young people have it, it's just kind of... Like when young people get arthritis, it's usually either the result of some kind of major trauma to that joint, or uh, it's, it's, a, it's an autoimmune issue, where your immune system is attacking your own tissue. Not really. Okay. If you have an adaptive system, you all really have no concern for my emotional well-being? No. Emma keeps cracking her fingers in my ears. I, I'm doing it in my own area. No, you're did, you, own did you say no, Emma, when I said, do you all really not have any concern for my emotional well-being? Um, <laughs> no. concern for ours. No concern for yours. Oh. Whoa. Wow. Okay. Shh. If, if you have an adaptive system, these phagocytic cells will present pieces of foreign material. Okay, if you have an adaptive system, which we do, but not all animals do, if you have an adaptive system, these phagocytic cells will present pieces of foreign material to the adaptive system. Okay? So the innate system, primarily made up of phagocytic cells, these phagocytic cells eat foreign material, and if you have an adaptive system, which we do, not all animals do, all mammals do, probably all vertebrates, but not all animals. If you have an adaptive system, these phagocytic cells, remember this point is still under phagocytic cells, these phagocytic cells will present pieces of that foreign material. So they'll, they'll eat it, they'll, they'll tear it apart, they'll basically digest it, and then they'll take pieces of it and present it on their surface to the adaptive system. They feed adaptive cells. Adaptive. Yeah, cells that are part of the adaptive system. But then why is that under a million? Well, because they've got to they've got to present this first. Well, They're okay, presenting. So they, they, yeah, so like they present the food. Yes, to the cells that are part of the adaptive system. Well, that means yeah. maybe, um, but again, remember that's only going to be in animals that have an adaptive system. Shh. Oh oh oh. Shh. Yeah. Are phagocytic cells, is that like the pH cells? Is that what cells are? Phagocytic cells? The most common type of phagocytic cell are called macrophages. So what are, like, like on the exams and stuff, like, what are pH? What are pH? I don't know. I, I need to see the context. Okay, so adaptive system found in vertebrates. Made up, that's an ugly A, made up of T cells, 
and B cells. The adaptive system made up of T cells and B cells. I have no idea. I mean, I'm sure at some point they stood for something, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh uh. Nope. Okay. Made up of T cells and B cells. Shh. B cells. Shh. Make antibodies. So your B cells make antibodies. And somebody tell me what you know about antibodies. They do protect you. Katie? Don't you take You can. You can take some antibody stuff to help. What's that? Yeah. So they're a little bit different. You can take antibodies. They'll usually give them uh, antibody treatment for certain illnesses. Like white blood cells. They're made by white blood cells. Okay. Shh. B cells make antibodies. T cells. T cells do many things. <laughs> and you don't really need to know what those things are in preparation for the AP exam. You just need to have that point and so that you anticipate if you're asked some kind of a question that is addressing the adaptive system and talking about a lot of different things that aren't making antibodies, it's going to be a T cell. Okay? So T cells do many things. But don't make antibodies. And then the adaptive system, going back to this first level, learns. Learns to fight specific diseases. So the adaptive system learns to fight specific diseases. It's not just blindly eating anything for it. This adaptive system learns to fight very specific diseases. The reason why you most of the time only get chicken pox once in your life is because your adaptive system learns to so fight like that specific immune virus. Immune system. Yeah. yeah, I mean both of these are your immune system, but this is this is this is non-specific. This is just a general. Anything foreign, it will eat and will present it to this adaptive system. Okay? The adaptive system learns to fight something you've been infected with. So that's the chicken and pox virus mutates so slowly that once you get it, or you, if you get the uh, vaccine for it, that you're going to always make antibodies for that. And if you're ever exposed to that virus in the future, your adaptive system will get rid of it before you get sick. And this works really with any of the... Um, what, 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 any of the vaccines that you get. You get a vaccine for polio, mini, um, meningitis, you could do the flu shot every year, and then it's just a matter of... Tetanus. Like, in right, tetanus. So, Emma and Katie. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, what exactly is chicken pox? Like, why does it produce red dots? Why is it called chicken pox? Because it looks very similar to a disease that chickens get. Um, it is not because we get it from chickens. Uh, and so in, in chicken pox, a rash, is, a rash is fairly common. A rash is a fairly common um, sign that you, your immune system is responding to a virus, typically, in some way. Now, this virus just happens to be around your entire body, so your rash develops typically around the entire body. Um, so the rash, it's not like that the viruses are attacking your skin. Your rash is the result of an antiviral response of your immune system. Yeah. Tor uh, Katie and then Tori. Okay, so those two systems, they're types of immune systems? Correct. They're divisions of the immune divisions. system. Divisions. Okay, yeah. so they're both present in most, like, us. Yes, so in vertebrates, we have both. Okay, and then some of them only have one. Correct. Yep. 
So all animals, as far as we know, have an innate, innate immune system. Probably all vertebrates also have an adaptive system. The adaptive system relies on this innate system to present that foreign material. Tori. Okay, so are chickenpox like a variation of like smallpox? No. No. No, it's completely mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Isa. Is that true that I I mean there are a lot of ways but you can take it to make I have no idea there there are a lot of things that you can do I mean really the concern is to try to reduce the itch so you don't develop scars but really you don't really have a great deal of concern by the rash and there's really not a, a, a great deal of concern period now when that virus comes back sometimes later in life and you get a flare-up and you get shingles it's very, very painful because now, now the virus is is basically attacking your neurons and yeah, you usually just get it in your core, like around your abdomen. Yeah, it's very painful. Okay. Any questions? This is it. This is it for forty three. So unless you have any questions, we're just gonna erase this and go right on to forty five. Uh, like, can we take a break so I don't listen? We, we can't. We only have, we have less than 15 minutes. Tori, it's really not that hard of a decision to make. Just, just go. If you just call and you answer. I'm going to be super tired. Your problem. Your problem. Chapter 45. <laughs> There's a road called Country Road off of New Hall Ranch Road. I saw it. I was like, Chapter 45. Shh. Endocrine system. Chapter 45, the endocrine system. Now, the nice thing about chapter 45 is we've seen a lot of the principles from chapter 45 before, and they're kind of coming back all together. It's like there's a little bit of it here, a little bit of it there, but in chapter 45, it all comes back in a nice little package. So chapter 45, the endocrine system. First thing you need to know, endocrine glands. Endocrine glands are glands with cells that secrete products into the surrounding fluid. So endocrine gland, endocrine glands. These are glands that have cells that secrete some product into the surrounding fluid. So on Friday, I believe that we talked about two different types of communication. We talked about chemical and electrical, right? And when is chemical communication really, really helpful? When you go to multiple places. When you need multiple parts, when you need multiple parts to execute a response. And when is an electrical signal really, really helpful? When you need a very specific, very quick response. So endocrine glands are glands with cells that secrete products into the surrounding fluid. You also have exocrine glands, and what does that root exo mean? Out. Outside. So exocrine glands are like endocrine glands, but they secrete their material outside of whatever that tissue is. So like your sweat glands, your sebaceous glands, 
Those are exocrine glands. But anyways, endocrine glands. There are five different types of products that we really worry about when we're talking about chemical communication. So this whole thing here, this is all chemical communication. Now somebody please remind me, how do we define communication? The transmission and reception of a signal. Okay, and in a chemical signal, there are three steps in the reception of a chemical signal. What are they again? Bind the ligand. Step one, receptor binds the ligand. Step two, Trans transduce the signal. Step three, response. respond, execute some response. Now the response is usually one of two things. How does this cell respond? It's usually in one of two ways. It changes. Right, it is going to change. It does something new, it stops doing something old. So it transcribes some new product or modifies an old product in a new way. Okay? So transcribes something new or modifies something old in a new way. Right? Yeah. Reuse. Right? Okay. All right. Chemical communication. We have five chemicals that we need to deal with. First one, hormones. Okay, first type of chemical that you may see involved in chemical communication. Hormones. What's Why are they so Well, they've got to change. They've got to change several parts of your body simultaneously. Right? So there are several parts of your body that have to change as you're finishing the maturation process. And then, of course, there's unintended consequences of having a hormone surge. What is that, a hormone surge? A hormone surge? I mean, it's just where you have a release of a great deal of a particular type of hormone. And so uh, you, you have it when, again, so chemical communication is great when you need multiple parts to execute some some overall product. Mm -hmm. So if that overall product is reaching sexual maturity, there are several parts of your body that are involved in that process. Okay, and so you need hormones in order to execute that. And then there are some things that are just kind of a byproduct. Like the way your brain, the way your brain interprets how you feel becomes really complicated when you've got just massive amounts of hormones changing your body in very big ways. All right? Okay, so hormones. These hormones are typically one of three products. They are either polypeptides, and what is that? Um, Those are proteins. Although we'll use the term polypeptide because sometimes it's not a functional protein. It's just a big chain of amino acids. It's not really a functional protein. Okay, so they're either uh, polypeptides, modified amino acids and what's an amino acid well it's the building blocks of proteins an individual amino acid is not a protein right these are the building blocks so it's either a polypeptide a whole string of amino acids it's a modified amino acid or it's a lipid and what are lipids yeah they're fats these are nonpolar uh, organic molecules. Now, somebody figure this out for me. Based on our principles of, of moving materials into and out of cells, how are you going to respond if the signal is a polypeptide? Because remember, the first step in that response to the chemical signal is to bind the ligand. Where's that, where's that receptor going to be? Is this polypeptide going to move efficiently through the plasma membrane? No. no, it is not. Which means the receptor for this is going to be where? On the outside. On the outside of the cell. What about an amino acid? Is this going to efficiently move through the plasma membrane? Probably not because amino acids are polar. At the very least, they might very well be charged even. Now, some of them are nonpolar. Now, what about a lipid? Polar or nonpolar? 
Nonpolar. Are lipids going to move well through plasma membranes? You bet they are. And so the receptor for lipids is oftentimes inside of the cell. The receptor for binding lipid hormones oftentimes inside of the cell. Okay, so that's one chemical. You ready for number two? Yes. Chemical number two. Local regulators. Local. Local. Oh, I know. <laughs> the second chemical, local regulators. These are chemicals that modify the surrounding environment of the cell. Okay, number three, neural transmitters. Sounds like electrical stuff. It is, it's a chemical signal, but it, it keeps an electrical signal moving. Okay, neural transmitters, like dopamine, which makes you feel good. Happy stuff. Happy stuff. Happy stuff. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. When you're put under anesthesia, what does it do? <laughs> it depends on the type of anesthetic. <laughs> They're some of the highest paid physicians, but they also have the highest uh, malpractice insurance rates. What's malpractice? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. Like, if somebody dies, like, yeah. they could get sued while they have it and never work again? Uh, potentially, but they usually have really good malpractice insurance. Okay, um... But most most of the time, it's it's basically just cutting off your your brain's ability to communicate uh, to tissues. But when you actually get put under, it, it creates a a surge of material that basically just uh, shuts several parts of your brain down. Okay, neural hormones, and the last one used very rarely in humans. In fact, there's very little evidence that we use them at all, although some people would argue that there is. Pheromones. Oh. Pheromones. Pheromones. Yeah, what bees use to communicate with each other, what ants use to communicate with each other. Drosophila. Is it a P H A? Pharo. This an R. P H E R. Let me make that a very obvious H. Pheromones. Okay, so these are basically our five categories of chemical signals. If you see any of these five words, if you see any of these five words on the AP exam, what is the topic being addressed? Chemical communication. And then you're going to think about what is the definition of communication? The transmission and the reception of signals. The reception of chemical signals, step one. Find the ligand. Step two. Transduce the signal. Step three. Execute some response. Okay, so if you see any of these five words, you're going to think chemical communication. You're going to think those concepts. Yeah. Carrie. Is this, is this chemical yeah. communication in general or just in relationship to the endocrine system? Uh, in general, but the endocrine system is where we see most of this happening. Okay. All right. Any questions? I don't know. Okay. All right, leave your stuff. We're done with chapter 45.